Hello everybody, I am the Linkzilla. I hope that you're all doing well after the holiday season and whatnot. Hope that you all had a great time. I wanted to do these videos in what was intended to be a review of the recently released Rise of Skywalker film because that's a film that I really want to talk about, especially in how it relates to the larger picture going on over at Disney Lucasfilm. Unfortunately, my first attempt to talk about the film had so much information in regards to why this movie ended up the way it did that my first attempt to record this was over an hour long and I was barely halfway through the first act of the movie. So I decided to break these videos up into several different pieces trying to stick to a specific topic and this topic on this video is basically giving my thoughts on why the sequel trilogy was never going to work in the first place. I'm gonna basically give Disney Lucasfilm the utmost benefit of the doubt here when I literally tell them that they did not know what they were in for when they bought the franchise from Lucas back in... what was that? Was it November of 2011? Or was it 2012? They were literally up against an uphill battle when it took, when it came to bringing this franchise back into the mainstream. But the problem is, is that it's clear from their attitude and the direction that they took, they were taking this uphill battle backwards and with square wheels. So effectively speaking, they did not have the right mindset going into this from the very beginning. Basically, we all have our feelings on George Lucas. I still respect the man, even after like everything that the prequels did, because this was a guy that took risks with his movies. He had a vision of what he wanted to create, and he was the only one bold enough to actually run with the movies. You see, that's why... There aren't many directors like George Lucas in Hollywood anymore because Lucas is willing to take risks. I mean, he directed the Howard the Duck movie. That's literally the riskiest thing anyone has ever done. Then he had this idea for a movie that basically took the style and themes of the old Flash Gordon serials, combined them with a little bit of uh, Japanese Asian samurai culture and whatnot, it basically created a story that he felt people could get behind, set in a galaxy far, far away. And Fox had so little faith that that movie would end up being a hit that they let him keep all the merchandising rights. From there, a juggernaut was born. A juggernaut that was literally a cultural phenomenon that basically helped change the scope of filmmaking forever. It literally showed that this was what was capable of being created, an entire expansive universe that could be conveyed visually. It was an impressive feat, the Star Wars franchise was, and it seemed to only get better with time. A lot of people feel like the prequel movies aren't that good. The worst that I can say about them is that they are the slightest bit inadequate, because I gotta admit, my appreciation for the prequel movies is actually in, is actually made even greater by the knowledge of everything that didn't make it into the movies. All the stuff about the political intrigue and like how the galaxy was literally played against the Jedi, what the extent of Palpatine's plan actually was, all that stuff would have been great to see in the movies, but we didn't get the chance to see it, so... Not to basically say that that's necessarily a bad thing, because the movies wanted to focus more on the characters, and me personally, all the people complaining about how cheesy the dialogue is in the prequels, the dialogue was cheesy in the original trilogy as well. I'm just saying that there's kind of like an apples and oranges kind of thing. Sure, you basically expect these films to get better with time, but... I feel like Lucas was more or less keeping with the spirit of things. But let's actually talk about, like, why he did what he did. A lot of people were under the impression that he sold Star Wars. Nah, he didn't just sell Star Wars. He sold Lucasfilm, the studio itself, as well as the IPs that Lucasfilm had owned. So, a lot of people assume that he sold Star Wars because he didn't want to take responsibility for it anymore because he was tired of all the fan backlash. But 
The truth of the matter is, is that Lucasfilm was on the verge of bankruptcy. So, I mean, literally speaking, by the time they hadn't made a movie since Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, and that was like three, four years bef prior to this. So George was effectively like, either I m start making more movies in order to pay my people, or I sell the company. Because if I don't do something soon, 20,000 people that are under my employ are going to be out of a job. So, <clears throat> I don't necessarily know all the details. Maybe it's possible there was some kind of economic pressure from Disney, because Bob Iger literally has stated that when he became president of Lucasfilm in 2005, he literally stated he wanted to increase Disney's power by obtaining as many IPs as he could. One of them was Marvel, and the other was Star Wars. So, they were trying to get their hands on Star Wars for quite a long time, so... I guess they were literally just waiting for Di for Lucas to show a moment of weakness, or they might have created a moment of weakness for him. I don't know. I think that the real problem came in was that once the deal was struck, Lucas was allowed to appoint his own successor in the fact that he was allowed to basically appoint the new president and CEO of Lucasfilm under Disney, and he chose someone who he thought would be loyal to him because he had a long history of working with this person. That person turned out to be Kathleen Kennedy. And I'm sorry, but that woman is a complete snake in the grass. You look at every single movie that she's ever been attached to, and you realize something. These movies that she's been attached to were the ones where George Lucas or Steven Spielberg were heavily involved, and she is only ever listed as either a producer on these movies, in that she her, own, her, jo her only job is to push money at the project, or as an assistant to Spielberg or Lucas. So it literally becomes clear that she made her career by riding their coattails, and now she is president of Lucasfilm on top of the heap, believing that she actually got to that point by herself when literally she has only ever been standing on the shoulders of titans, as in George and Steven Spielberg. <clears throat> and we know that Kathleen Kennedy was a terrible choice for the for the leadership position at Lucasfilm because whenever she has been in a leadership role in the past, the project has literally been a complete disaster. Case in point, Jurassic Park 3. The movie that literally knocked the Jurassic Park franchise into a coma. Steven Spielberg wanted there to be a third movie. In fact, there are rumors circulating around that the original deal with Universal is that Universal would get six Jurassic movies. Unfortunately, Steven promised his friend, director Joe Johnston, director of the original Jumanji movie with Robin Williams and Captain America the First Avenger, both solid movies I really enjoy. He promised Johnson that if the, that when the third one comes along, you can direct it and whatnot. So Spielberg stepped out of the director's chair and took the role of executive producer. Now, basically speaking... A lot of people would say that Spielberg's role as an executive producer is a lot more hands-on, especially when it comes to the Jurassic Park franchise. But typically speaking, an executive producer is the top dog producer who basically, like, funds the project for the movie and whatnot. And effectively, they're not really on site as much as you would expect them to be. They basically, like... A, they need to basically supervise the project to see how progress is going. They either approve it or they disapprove it, and otherwise they basically like pr provide money and funding for the project. It's typical that an executive producer is not on site as often as the other producers are. And <clears throat> that becomes clear when you watch the documentary footage of the making of Jurassic Park 3, and you realize that Steven is not nearly as present in that documentary as he was in Jurassic Parks 1 and 2. Effectively speaking, I'd say that Spielberg is only around like 5% of the time. Person who is around most of the time 
is Kathleen Kennedy. It's clear that she had a lot more legroom and a lot more control on this project. Hell, this was the first time in the documentary where she got interviewed for the Jurassic franchise. I remember it vividly. She starts talking about how they wanted to bring the Pteranodons into the, fi into the films and whatnot. Basically speaking, it's clear that under her leadership, the film was a disaster. Because, literally speaking... The movie had begun shooting with a script that was basically approved by Steven, by the studio, and literally two weeks into shooting the movie, the shooting script was thrown out, and a new script had to be slapdashed together as quickly as possible. The movie was literally so bad, production on the movie was so bad, that Sam Neill was scared off of making another Jurassic Park movie until very recently where Colin Trevorrow somehow managed to convince him to come back as Dr. Grant for Jurassic World 3, and William H. Macy, who was in that movie playing the role of Paul Kirby, said it was one of the most unprofessional projects he had ever worked on, management on this movie is sloppy. He literally said, and I quote, someone needs to be shot. So effectively speaking, that is an example of what we see when Kathleen Kennedy gets any sort of control. The woman does not know what she is doing in the slightest. And now she is contr in control of one of the largest film franchise in existence. And what does she choose to do with it? Well, I don't know whether or not I should speak of this out of order or, what, or whether or not I should stick to a topic, but it's going to be clear when I start talking about the movies themselves that Kathleen Kennedy quickly established that she was not an ally to George Lucas. She was not going to be loyal to him in any way, shape, or form. She was going to completely kowtow to her Disney overlords because now she was in power and she no longer needed George or Steven to hold her up and help, and help make a career out of. <sighs> so she double-crossed him and basically, like... I don't necessarily know if she did what Disney wanted or if, or if act on her own volition, but it quickly became clear that she now, now that she was in control of a massive studio that basically was responsible for making these huge blockbuster movies, a big serious, a big serious medium, that she was going to use this studio as her platform to push her political message, her political agenda. And I'm sorry, but sometimes you gotta leave your own personal politics at the door when it comes to making a movie, especially when you already have a built-in fan base. Of course, Disney was all about exploiting that built-in fan base from the beginning, so... The thing that I can say about Kathleen Kennedy that is just so misguided that I have basically hated from the beginning is this attitude that she and others like her seem to have copped with the idea of Star Wars. And basically with the idea of many things, when you think about it, I'm not going to lie that basically for the, le for the greater part of its existence, Star Wars has enjoyed a fan base that is made up largely of... Largely of a male demographic, male, well, uh, young young men that basically enjoy collecting action figures and comic books that love basically buying all the Star Wars collectibles and whatnot. Basically, that's what Star Wars' initial fan base is made of. You imagine someone who likes Star Wars. I typically believe that the stereotype that you would automatically think of, you would imagine someone that basically like looks like a typical geek, I would imagine. But I'm just saying that that's a stereotype that I feel like the entire world basically has, because Star Wars for the longest time was viewed as a nerdy, geeky, geek culture kind of thing. Star Wars wasn't always a huge juggernaut that it was today in pop culture. It's definitely a pop culture iconic thing nowadays, but it didn't always enjoy that status. 
Star Wars was originally enjoyed by a very niche audience. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. Kathleen Kennedy was under the impression, the foolish impression, and she now has a legion of like-minded fools under that exact same impression that just because Star Wars has predominantly had a male-oriented fan base, that it was only ever a male-oriented thing. That it was somehow only ever just an all-boys-no-girls-allowed club. And I gotta say, that's one of the stupidest things I have ever fucking heard, because Star Wars in its design is literally meant to appeal to anybody. It literally has universal appeal, regardless of who the protagonists are, regardless of basically who the audience is, because you know why? The original Star Wars trilogy literally played up upon story tropes that are timeless. Tropes and themes that have been used in storytelling for centuries. Some of our oldest stories literally have the same story beats as the Star Wars franchise. The idea of good versus evil, the underdog versus the overwhelming odds, the David versus Goliath, the father versus son. These are universal story beats that anybody can pick up on and appreciate, so it really just depends on your taste. But what I'm trying to get at here is that Star Wars was never exclusively for guys. It was never a for-guy thing. And I should know, I grew up in a household with two older sisters and a mother, and the first time we were all introduced to Star Wars, we all loved it! Literally speaking, that same Christmas, my brother basically got like a huge collection of Star Wars action figures because my parents thought that he liked Star Wars the most out of all of us, and all three of us, me and my two sisters, we wanted to play with him playing with his Star Wars toys. And it's like, yeah, we play with we play Star Wars. We like Star Wars. It's this cross-gender thing. The boys like Star Wars, the girls like Star Wars. There's universal appeal across both. It never has been exclusively this one thing, and yet Kathleen Kennedy has created this narrative that it's only ever been treated like this one thing, and that's just not fair, because for the one thing, not only is that being disrespectful for the females that have always enjoyed the franchise, who have always been fans of the franchise, it's disrespectful to the male audience that was a fan of the franchise before because we weren't keeping people out. We weren't gatekeeping. We weren't telling them, you're not allowed to like this. This is our thing. And yet she comes in and she starts treating it like that's how, it, that's how it's always been. That's not how it's always been. How it was before is that Star Wars was viewed as this very geeky thing. Critics hated it when it first came out because they thought that it was just a silly, cheesy fantasy su fantasy space movie, but fans appreciated it a whole lot more because there was something to appreciate there. But because it wasn't necessarily easily accessible by a lot of people and, and there was like such a huge toy branding marketing empire behind it, it was written off. It was written off as as being nothing more than childish and geeky. Effectively speaking, like, people associated with Star Wars were considered geeks and creeps. So effectively speaking, we didn't close the door, they were the ones who rejected it at first. Then, a few, about a decade ago, somebody realized that, hey, this Star Wars thing is like a major box office juggernaut. We could actually make, we actually should get some of that money. And so basically now Star Wars is this main pop culture phenomenon, and even worse than that, geek culture and misappropriation of geek culture is now in vogue. Effectively speaking, they want to talk about cultural appropriation? Yeah, well they're misappropriating geek culture by, all, by doing all of this. So effectively speaking, now everything that was considered nerdy and not cool in the past is being considered cool and in vogue now, so now all the normies want to get their hands on it. Now, basically, like, that's, 
Now, I'm not basically saying this as a gatekeeper. I'm just saying that this is the phenomenon that's happening. Now that suddenly something is considered cool, they want to come in and they want to take it. It's not about sharing it or experiencing it. No, it's about taking it and making it into what they want it to be. They want to basically, like... Chain. They want to change this franchise in order to pander to them and their sensibilities rather than experiencing the franchise for what it basically always was. And that's how Kathleen's agenda plays into this. Because, literally speaking, one of the things that I actually predicted about this movie was the idea that they would probably go with a female protagonist. Because... I basically, like, figured that they didn't want to be entirely derivative of the other two trilogies, so maybe the best way to pursue that would be to have a female protagonist, and I was actually all for it. I thought that that would basically, like, provide an interesting dichotomy, that maybe she would be, I don't know, she would be basically like Han Solo and Princess Leia's daughter, and, like, maybe she would be Luke Skywalker's niece. That would be an interesting idea to tell with, d with new stories, as how this new generation of heroes has to live up to the legacy that their forebearers had basically come to... had basically established in the past. We didn't get that. So, I think that I've said my piece about Kathleen Kennedy at this point. We all know that her politics, they're bullshit. I mean... I, I think that on some level that Kathleen definitely does believe it, but the greater whole of Disney doesn't believe it. Disney itself is nothing more than a bunch of progressive hypocrites that are only using progressive ideas because they think that they are popular right now. They want a virtue signal, and but they don't actually want to be virtuous. They don't want to espouse to these virtues. They just want to make it look like they actually are espousing them. They want to make it look like they are virtuous when they themselves are not actually this vir They don't actually have these virtues. But Kathleen Kennedy basically trying to say that the Force was female, that shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what the Force is because the Force literally cannot be male or female. I don't know about you guys, but the Force actually doesn't have a distinct personality or physical embodiment. The Force is an energy field. Now, I don't know if you guys have ever looked at electricity and determined, huh, I wonder if that electricity is masculine or feminine. Because any sane, reasonable human being would realize that it is... It doesn't have masculine or feminine traits. It's electricity. It cannot have masculine or feminine traits. The only kind of physical trait that it has is electrons that go zappity zap zap. So how is it that you're going to ascribe human personific anthropomorphized personification traits to an energy field? Hell, I think it's bad enough that like people believe that the Force actually has a spectrum. And un even more unfortunately for me is that Disney has gone out of its way to kind of confirm that that's basically the kind of case when I think it's far more interesting to consider that the Force not having a... S that the Spectrum is literally all just a matter of point of view. But I can make another video on that. Plus, my theories, they're pro they've basically been proven wrong anyways, but I'll just make a vi video on that later. Okay, so now that I've basically spoken about Kathleen Kennedy, let's talk about the trilogy itself, because effectively speaking, I just still can't believe it. I was in such denial when it came to it, because I didn't want episodes 7, 8, and 9 to be finished, because... I didn't like the fact that not a lot of people appreciated the prequels, and it seemed that as time went on, people were, like, going more and more against the prequels, and I just think that it's because it was mostly a, the popular opinion at the time. But I didn't... But retroactively, the prequels made the idea of a 7, 8, and 9 trilogy completely superfluous because that would make the entire saga completely lopsided. George Lucas had this idea. He had an idea for the original Star Wars, The Star Wars, that's what the script was, 
And it was basically all three movies combined into one. And when he realized that he couldn't do it the way he wanted to do it, he had to basically, like, cut it down to where basically the original Star Wars was just, like, a one-third of the script with the climax of the intended ending of the entire thing. And then, and that's how, and because it was a major success, he was able to make a trilogy out of it with significant and substantial rewrites, I should say. I mean, in the original version of Star Wars, Vader wasn't the main antagonist of the entire thing. He was actually killed off in part one with even less fanfare than Darth Maul, and Anakin Skywalker wasn't meant to be Darth Vader, and most importantly, Princess Leia was not meant to be Luke's sister. You see, that's another thing that made the idea of the sequel trilogy a bit iffy in my mind, because the idea for 7, 8, and 9 in Lucas's head originally was to have Luke's sister, her identity, be a mystery. She was originally intended to be a woman named Nelleth, Nellis Skywalker, who was hidden somewhere out there in the galaxy, who hadn't made an appearance in the trilogy up until this point. The sequel trilogy was all about finding her, training her to be and training her to be a Jedi just like Luke was, and maybe the possibility of trying to prevent her from falling to the dark side. Who knows, maybe she could have already fallen to the dark side by the time Luke found her, and now he has to bring her back as well. That's basically, I think, when Lucas got the idea to make this entire thing into a family drama. He basically decided to make Princess Leia into Luke's long-lost sister. Now, don't get me wrong, it fits with the whole family narrative, but it creates a, a narrative crux that I don't think the franchise could ever recover from, because it's like, it felt a little bit too easy. It's one of the things that I've always disliked about the... The, the original trilogy with Luke being with Leia being Luke's sister because it ultimately like prevented the possibility of a new story being tell, told and it just felt too immediate too easy like Luke just found out that he has a sister and it turns out his sister is the one woman that he's been running around the galaxy with for the last four years. And no, I'm not going to go into detail about how there was a semi-incestual relationship with them, because even Lucas didn't know that they were going to be brother and sister at that point. Okay, so, basically speaking, that was what the idea was. That the sequel trilogy would be about finding the sister, he canned that, so the prequel trilogy would be all about exploring the older generation, the old guard. We would go back, we would see Obi-Wan's story, we would see Yoda's story, we would see the Emperor's story, and most importantly, we would see Anakin's story. And that is basically like when you realize that the entire story of the Star Wars saga, episodes 1 through 6, they're actually all about Anakin. They're about Darth Vader's story. They are about his humble beginnings, his rise, his fall, and his redemption. Effectively speaking, like, Vader is, in a lot of ways, the main character of this franchise. So, it just made me wonder, how are you possibly going to do a Star Wars sequel trilogy without Vader? Because you can't necessarily do it like that. It's... Lucas had retrofitted this entire thing to where it's Vader's story. Anything else is going to be is going to feel is going to make the story feel lopsided and that's exactly what happened. But as I basically like go on to explain everything it's just just basically kind of bear with me as I basically kind of like explain what my initial fears were when it came to the sequel trilogy because like I mentioned, I was in such denial when it came to the idea of Lucas, of Disney actually making new movies. I thought that they would be content with either making spin-off films and more TV shows. I honestly thought that they had gotten their hands on Star Wars IP just so that they could gain the merchandising rights to the new to to the characters and whatnot, so that they could control the toys and whatnot. Because, let's face it, Star Wars is an empire that is built upon the toy set. So, 
basically speaking, like, that's how Lucas was able to make so much money on these things, enough money to literally fund the entire prequel trilogy himself. Lucas was literally rolling in it, so, because the toy empire was just that massive, and I thought that Disney would be content with literally just that. Boy, was I wrong. I basically heard the news that they wanted to make new movies, but I still had my doubts, because it's like, there's no way they can make these movies without Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Princess Leia. They approached Mark Hamill with the idea of wanting to make new movies, and Mark Hamill literally said, I don't want to do it unless Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford sign on to do it as well. And, to me, that's where I believed we were finally safe. That we didn't have to worry about new movies coming in, being made by people who didn't understand them and ruining everything. I thought that we were safe because for decades, literally decades, Harrison Ford had claimed he hated playing Han Solo and didn't want to play him ever again. Hell, he wanted Han Solo to be killed off in the first Star Wars movie. He hated the fact that he was dragged along for the next two movies, so if anybody was not going to do this movie, it was going to be Harrison Ford. And so, Harrison Ford rejecting to do these movies saved the franchise from utter destruction. At least, that's how it went in an alternate universe, where somehow or another, Disney must have offered him something. I don't know what resources Disney had to offer him, but they basically managed to somehow convince him to come on to this movie under the condition that he be killed off in it. This would be the last time he would ever return to the role of Han Solo. And I gotta admit, that kind of friggin' irritates me. It kind of friggin' irritates me because, who knows? We actually probably could have gotten the sequel trilogy years ahead of time with one under George Lucas's direction. That probably could have been a whole lot better had Harrison just simply agreed to friggin' play Han Solo one last time back then. But nope, instead he waits until the mouse takes over. I think that one of the worst things about the entire affair with Disney taking over the Star Wars franchise is ultimately the fact that George wanted to be kept on as a consultant in order to make these movies. He even drew up a treatment and an outline for the next three movies on what ideas could possibly be explored. And I gotta admit, I'm actually really curious to see what George's version of 7, 8, and 9 looked like, because I actually believe that they'd be a lot more cohesive and fit well within the narrative, far better than what we ended up getting. Because... <laughs> I just cannot believe that they, once they got control of the franchise, the control of the IP, they literally took... George Lucas's original treatment for 7, 8, 9, and they threw it in the garbage. There's going to be a lot of that, throwing things in the garbage. Just keep that in mind. I think that the only thing of substance that they actually took from George Lucas's treatment is the idea that the new protagonist is female. And it's like, well, good on George. He basically had the idea of doing a female protagonist, and he doesn't have an agenda behind him. So... You get, you get the sense that he was actually being sincere. Next, they nuked the expanded universe from orbit. Decades worth of source material, comics, novels, toy lines, all this good stuff that they could have drawn inspiration from, canonized stuff approved by George Lucas, was immediately wiped from canon. All this, all this canonized stuff was suddenly decanonized. And I literally said it. I literally said it back then, and this latest movie has proven my point. The reason that they did that was that so that they could take credit for these... For the ideas that the expanded universe had, so that they wouldn't have to credit the original creators. Because... When you look at this new trilogy, it takes a lot of story beats from the from the expanded universe, and they're just claiming credit for these ideas. They're 
flat out plagiarists, and they friggin' know it, but they're still gonna claim credit for them anyways. When realistically speaking, all you had to do, all you had to do was just adapt the stories. Adapt the stories of the expanded universe, do them justice, and things would have turned out fine. A whole lot better than you would have imagined. So, when it became clear that the movies were going to be made, I remember telling myself in 2014, when I basically like started my my new rotation at my new college and whatnot, basically speaking, I remember walking to school one day and basically thinking about the new upcoming Star Wars movies when they would eventually come. And here is exactly my thought process on why I knew that the movies weren't going to work. Because, number one, the, f the backlash against the prequels had become so loud and so obnoxious on the internet. A minority opinion, I am certain of it. The backlash against them had become so loud and so obnoxious that the media had become convinced that that is how everybody felt about the prequel movies, when really, to a lot of people, the prequels are still acceptable. They're still enjoyable movies, and not nearly as terrible as certain others would have you believe. The, because that's how the internet is. You don't hear the voices of moderate people. You only hear those who are loud and obnoxious enough to demand to be heard. So... Basically speaking, because there was such a backlash against the prequels, I knew that Disney was going to play these movies as safely as possible. To the point where, literally speaking, I predicted it, they were going to double down on the nostalgic imagery of the original trilogy. As in, they were going to be so desperate to buy the goodwill of the fans that they were literally going to say, Hey, forget all that flashy prequel stuff. We're going to show you stuff that we know you want to see. Look at all this cool stuff from the original trilogy. Look at it. Look at how, look at how cool we, uh, we are. Look at how nostalgic it is. Give us your money, please. I hated the idea of them doing that because it was nothing more than a narrative and creative crux. It would show how creatively bankrupt the studio making these movies would be and how scared they would actually they would be of actually do of actually making something new. Instead, they would only go the safe route of making things that they were certain would please the fans. And it's like, no. Star Wars fans don't need to be pandered to like this. Star Wars fans are in this for the story. But they didn't understand that. They didn't understand anything like that. Next, we have something that I knew was going to be an even bigger problem that I knew exact that I knew exactly was going to happen. You see Basically speaking, take the original trilogy. You have the story about a farm boy meets a meets a princelet, a princess and a rogue smuggler and basically they go on an adventure together. They're joined by this wise old mentor who has a a long personal history with the main villain of the entire series and eventually it turns out the main hero has a history with that villain as well and has to learn from other wise old mentors that have the that basically have pieces of a story that are missing from this version of the story. So effectively speaking, the story basically kind of became how to say it. When you go back and you watch the prequels, which are basically Anakin and Obi-Wan's story as young men and how they got to the point where they are in the original trilogy, you realize that going from episodes 1, 2, and 3 to episodes 4, 5, and 6, there's a passing the torch situation going on. Obi-Wan Kenobi was killed off in part 1 after being such a massive character in 1, 2, 3. Now, I feel like that would ultimately mean a whole lot more had we seen, like, 1, 2, and 3 first, but either way, you realize that the old guard is basically passing on and has to pass the torch to the new generation. So, effectively speaking, it's like, 
you realize that Disney is now going to do the exact same thing. I mean, effectively, it was a bad idea to begin with because the prequel trilogy made the entire saga Darth Vader's story without no ifs, ands, or buts about it. So it was a bad idea from the begin to begin with to continue with the sequel trilogy from this point because you can't tell any more stories with Vader. He's passed on. He's... He's been redeemed. He's Anakin Skywalker once more, and more, more importantly, he's dead. So, <clears throat> so what exactly are you going to do? <laughs> so basically, I knew that with this new trilogy, we were going to get our original characters back, the characters that we wanted to see, except we were going to have them get killed off one by one so that the new generation could take over, a passing the torch kind of thing. Now don't get me wrong, I expected that. It's a trope, it's a storytelling trope, it's an inevitability that we all have to deal with at some point, that the older, wiser generation eventually dies, leaving the future in the hands of the new, younger generation who hopefully have learned something from them. But here's where the main problem is, because Episode 7 was a 40-year-long nut that the fanbase had been waiting all this time to bust. The thing that we wanted to see most of all was the return of Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, and Princess Leia. We wanted to learn what they had been up to in the past 40 years since the end of Return of the Jedi. And more importantly, we wanted to see all three of them together again. And I don't mean any disrespect to Anthony Daniels as C-3PO or Peter Mayhew as Chewbacca. It's basically implied that they would be there as well. But basically, it's like it's like Mark Hamill said, I won't agree to do these movies unless Carrie Fisher and Harrison Ford agree to sign on as well. We wanted to get the old gang back together again. So... So the idea is Disney knows at this point that they are riding so much on fan nostalgia that fans would literally revolt if the original trilogy characters were not brought back in order to be a part of this new trilogy. And at the same time, they don't want the old characters to overshadow the new characters. And I'm just left thinking that that's... Uh, they honestly underestimated how much fans wanted to see Luke Skywalker as the Grand Jedi Master that he was destined to be. And that goes to show like how badly everything just got screwed up because Disney was just not prepared to make these movies. They were not prepared for the friggin' minefield that they were walking into. So you basically have this no-win scenario where you know you have to bring the original characters back, or else no one's going to give a damn about your movie, but you don't want the original characters to overshadow your new characters, which, quite frankly, the writing should have basically been the solution to that. You have, you have a good writer, you don't necessarily need to worry about characters overshadowing other characters. And you know that at some point you're going to have to kill these characters off. I'm pretty sure that fans expected it, Hell, I remember basically, like, suddenly having a thought after watching the first trailer that involved Han Solo and Chewbacca in The Force Awakens that, what exactly is gonna happen? What if they actually end up dying in this movie? And that's suddenly where I had, like, a bit of pause, because it's like, oh, damn. I think that basically, like, one of the worst things about it is, is that the original guy that they hired to write the script for The Force Awakens, he basically told them that he would need six months to a year in order to make something of Star Wars quality. And Disney decided to instead fire him and instead go to J.J. Abrams, 
literally one of the friggin' most overrated directors in Hollywood today. A hack that thinks that he's the next Spielberg, when literally he's not even remotely close to Spielberg's level. Basically, Abrams and some other guys slapped together a script in like just a couple of months, and they immediately began shooting with it. I basically have hated J.J. Abrams ever since I first learned his name, because even though he only produced the Cloverfield movies, I'd say that he's so well attached to the Cloverfield movies that it really def it definitely doesn't necessarily matter all that much anymore if he directed it or not. Ever since I saw that movie, I've always had a bad association with J.J. Abrams' name, because Cloverfield... I think that we can all agree at this point, Cloverfield is a failed concept, and it's a failed trilogy. And he actually thought that it was somehow going to take the place of the American kaiju. Yeah, and King Kong is over there smoking a cigar saying, Am I a joke to you? I gotta admit, J.J. Abrams bought a whole lot of goodwill from me when it came to the Star Trek movies, but... I didn't understand what the problem with those movies was until now, and I definitely understand nowadays, and I feel bad about that. But I think I'll save that for when I start talking about the actual movie and when I get down to it, because I got I actually think that J.J. Abrams is one of the most shameless filmmakers that has ever in Hollywood nowadays. Like, the amount of shamelessness in his movies that he puts into them rivals Uwe Boll in terms of shamelessness, and Boll only made movies as a tax write-off. I think that at this point, I've talked about the uphill struggle, I've talked about Kathleen Kennedy's bad decision-making, bad direction and whatnot, I've talked about all the hurdles and obstacles that they would have to overcome in order to actually make this these movies happen and actually make them good, it literally was always going to be a lose-lose situation. We were going to get movies that just didn't fit in the scope of the Star Wars saga because the Star Wars saga at that point had its conclusion. Its overarching story had been told. Anything else was just going to make the series feel completely lopsided. And then from that point on, and then with Disney, the fact that they basically were going to try and make these movies would just basically, like, always... There would always be pushback against them because they there was no way they could ever meet fan expectations. Now, I'm basically giving... That's me giving them the benefit of the doubt when it comes to this entire process because, literally speaking, they don't deserve that kind of courtesy. They seriously do not deserve that at all. It's not fan expectations that they that basically ruined this trilogy, as we will get to as we start talking about the movies themselves. It really is basically like fan expectations had a lot to do with it, but I don't think that the fans are to blame for expecting quality of um, quality movies that fit with the overall themes and nature of the Star of the Star Wars franchise. I think that basically Disney just assumed that these were just silly fantasy movies that basically like uh, oh, that basically like were just action driven. They were blockbusters. They were popcorn movies. No, they were far beyond being just popcorn movies at this point because Star Wars as a cultural phenomenon had basically garnered such a strong and powerful following that. I really hate using this metaphor. It basically borders on a new religion. I remember what, listening to one guy, a scientist and philosopher that I used to basically take a lot of political cues from. He literally said that growing up in a religious society, he didn't consider himself as a Christian or a Mormon, depending on wherever he grew up. He considered himself more of a Jedi. He followed a Jedi philosophy which I admit basically kind of makes his life a little bit uh, boring, but who knows, the prequels hadn't been made at that point, so he didn't even know what a Jedi was. The simple fact is, is that there's this such a strong, passionate following with 
the Star Wars franchise that so many people are engrossed in, so many people have researched down to a T, so many people like examine the science of the Star Wars franchise as well, that there's really no way that you can touch this without setting off a kind of powder keg. It just wasn't a good idea, and they shouldn't have done it from the get-go. But, what can I say? Disney wants money. And when Disney wants money, Disney gets money. Monsters. So, Disney wants their money, regardless of who has to get killed in order to make it. And then, of course, by this point, the infection had begun to spread... The infection was already there in Disney Lucasfilm when Kathleen Kennedy took over, and anyone who didn't agree with her batshit politics at Lucasfilm was purged. So, congratulations, George. You managed to save the worst type of people from losing their jobs, and all the good type of people ended up losing their jobs anyway. I just basically want to finish off this video by saying a few closing arguments. Everything that I'm about to tell you about the Star Wars movies, it's bad. It's not good. They are really not that great of films. And basically speaking, as bad as the Star Wars movies have been, keep in mind that Disney now owns the IP for Indiana Jones as well. And it seems to me like they're not even going to bother trying to bring Harrison Ford on to play Indy one last time. They're already going with, like, a younger actor to play a younger Indiana Jones. If they did something like the young Indiana Jones Chronicles, not necessarily make new mo theatrically released movies, I'd be okay with that. Just release a new young Indiana Jones Chronicles on Disney+. Plus. Hell, I'm surprised that they haven't released the original young Indiana Jones Chronicles on Disney+. Plus. I'd watch that. So... I hope that you all enjoyed this video as rambly and as unscripted as it was. I'd say that it's like somewhat comprehensive, so I hope that you guys can like follow along with it. And I hope that you guys will join me next time when we talk about how the Star Wars sequel trilogy got off to a strong opening for those of, a, for those of us who weren't smart enough to see th the propaganda. Until such time as we speak again... I am the Linkzilla, and I'll catch you guys later.